precious book back in the bookstore. I will sign copies for only five dollars more. <laughs> I'm not used to working with a microphone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. In the back, yes? Good. I want to begin by thanking um, Mark and all of the officials here uh, for inviting me. It's truly an honor to be invited here uh, to speak to all of you for the first time. Um, and Mark, as an art historian, can we turn some of the lights down yes. so we can see the pictures? Yes. Thank you. Oops, oh. now I can't see my paper. <laughs> That's better, okay. One at all, don't you? Uh, Well, I do, yes, yes. Okay. Maybe. Is that okay? That's good. Yeah. And can you see the images fine yes. in the back now? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. we'll do that, okay. In the early 10th century, Gahik Arzruni, whom you see here, ruler of the southern Armenian kingdom of Vaspur Khan, some fitting site upon which to construct a new royal city. Kagik chose a small island in Lake Van, now in eastern Turkey, which offered superior defensive capabilities, a reliable freshwater spring, and the beauty appropriate for a royal setting. If there was an ever an audience that did not need a map, it's probably this audience, but um, I brought a map anyway. Um, obviously, uh, Lake Van here, a close-up of Lake Vaughan and my first foray into techno. Did you see the Did you see the arrow? Are you, you want to see it again? I'll do it again. Woo! <laughs> That's Octomar. It's about two miles off uh, from Jebash. The planning and the building of quote the splendid, famous, and stupendous city of Octomar are described in the history of the House of the Artsruni, a text commissioned by Kagik to celebrate his reign and ancestry. Kagik first secured the harbor and fortified the island with massive walls. He then directed the construction of princely residences, terraced gardens, and parks filled with trees and flowers. The centerpiece of the city was the royal palace, which appeared from all sides of the province as a great hill in the middle of the city. The palace church, dedicated to the Holy Cross, faced the north facade of the palace. The church of the Holy Cross, which you see here, is all that remains of Gagik Arzruni's 10th century city. It is justly celebrated for its exterior sculpture. I'm showing you here the south facade. And we have, there we go. And um, an example of the exterior sculpture, this is the narrative of Jonah. You see him here being tossed overboard by his companions into the mouth of the whale, then being regurgitated here. Um, according to Apocrypha, the whale's digestive system served as a depilatory, so he is bearded when he goes in and hairless when he comes out. <laughs> Akhtamar also preserves uh, two fresco cycles in the interior. And I want to mention here that all of the images that I'm going to show you this evening predate the recent restoration. Um, I'll be more than happy to talk about the restoration in the question and answer session, uh, but for this evening's purposes, um, I'm using older photographs and images, uh, as you can see. Uh, there was originally a Genesis cycle in the Drum of the Dome and a Christological cycle encircling the lower walls. Although Gagik's palace, palace has long since vanished, the history of the House of the Arts Rooney confirms that it too featured an elaborate decorative program. This evening I will analyze the royal messages conveyed by the decorative programs of the palace and the palace church. I will demonstrate that the decoration of the palace and the exterior sculpture of the palace church were linked by their presentation of Gagik as a powerful ruler, using iconography appropriated from Islamic courtly arts. I suggest, however, that the church's decorative program functions primarily to establish Gagik's piety. 
employing iconography which stresses the orthodox nature of his rule. This reading of the royal messages conveyed by the palace and palace church depends upon an understanding of the contemporary political situation and thus we are required to make a brief refresher course in late 9th and early 10th century Armenian history. Um, I will leave this up for you to look at um, while I give you a history lesson. Medieval Armenia was a vassal state of Islam administered by an Ostakhan, a resident governor. In terms of national organization, Armenia was a collection of principalities controlled by the Nahars, feudal lords, and dominated by one presiding prince, traditionally a member of the Bagratid family. In 885, the Bagratid presiding prince, Ashok I, became the first king to rule over a united Armenia since the end of the Arsacid dynasty in 480. Ashok maintained relations with Byzantium and enjoyed relative autonomy from the Caliphal court. His rule was instead undermined by internal divisions, by the civil wars constantly raging amongst the Armenian aristocracy, and by challenges from Nakharhars seeking to usurp Bagratid power or to free themselves from Bagratid suzerainty. Chief among the challengers were the Artsuruni. In an attempt to secure their loyalty, Ashut married his daughter to Derenik Artsuruni, Prince of Vaspura Khan. Gagik Artsuruni was the second of three sons born of this union. Ashut's son, Sumbat I, succeeded his father in 890. Sumbat's rule was threatened by the Ostakhan Afshin, who was not willing to accord to the new king the same semi-independent status enjoyed by his father. Wishing to fragment Bagratid rule and permanently subjugate Armenia, Afshin re-established control over many of the northern trade centers and encouraged those feudal lords who were eager to challenge Sumbat's suzerainty. Ashot Arzruni, prince of Vasporakam, and Gagik's elder brother, was one of those courted by Afshin. In 894, Ashot traveled to the Ostakhan's palace in Partak, now in Azerbaijan, in an apparent attempt to secure independent status for his principality. King Sumbat, enraged, encouraged the subsequent usurpation of Vasporakam by Akhumran Atsuruni, regent for the young Atsuruni princes. When Akhumran imprisoned his wards, Sumbat granted him the title Prince of Vespura Khan, legitimizing his status. In 894-95, Akhumran rather unwisely released Gagik Atsuruni, who successfully engineered his regent's murder and reestablished his elder brother's rule. Faced with this fait accompli, Sumbat restored the principality to Ashot Atsruni, raised Gagik to the status of general, and granted the title of governor to the youngest brother, Gurgin. Despite initial mistrust on both sides, Sumbat and his nephews undertook a series of successful military alliances, and as a reward for his services, Sambat I presented Ashot Atsruni with the important center of Nakachuvan. Afshin died in 901 of a disease that also decimated his army. And when his brother Yusuf was appointed as Ostakhan, King Sambat successfully petitioned the Caliph for the right to separate Armenia from Azerbaijan allowing him to send the yearly tribute directly to Baghdad, thus bypassing the Ostakhan. This move hardened Yusuf's resolve to reduce Armenia to a collection of principalities. But because he had inherited a reduced army, the early years of his Ostakhanate were for Armenia a time of relative respite from external aggression. Internal difficulties, however, continued to plague the kingdom. In 903, a dispute erupted between Ashot Artsruni and his kinsman Hassan over the possession of a strategic fortress. Some that dispatched the Catholicos and historian John Draskanakertsi 
To negotiate a peaceful settlement, the Catholicos extracted a solemn oath from Ashot to release Hassan unharmed, but Ashot disregarded his vow and had Hassan blinded. The Catholicos promptly ex excommunicated Ashot, and the prince died less than one year later in 904. Kagik Arzrini succeeded his brother as prince of Vaspur Khan. Sambat, unsure of Arzrini loyalty, took from them the city of Nakhchivan and restored it to the prince of Sunik. And when in 908 the caliph refused Yusuf's petition to return Armenia to his control, the Ostakhan openly rebelled against Baghdad. The caliph ordered Sumbat to provide military assistance in suppressing the Ostakhan, and Yusuf yielded in the face of the superior force. While Sumbat had successfully avoided a major armed conflict, the reconciliation between the caliph and Ostakhan forced him to provide each each with a full amount of yearly tribute. Many Nakharars, unable or unwilling to contribute the requested one-fifth of their possessions, sought to depose Sumbat. Kagik Artsruni offered Sumbat his loyal support if the city of Nakhchivan was returned to Artsruni control. When Sumbat refused, Kagik traveled to Azerbaijan and sought the Ostakhan's aid in reclaiming the disputed territory. Yusuf not only promised his assistance, he crowned Kagik king of Vaspar Khan. Concerned that Yusuf could now enlist the support of the formidable Vaspar Khan army, Sumbat sent the Catholicos to Azerbaijan to negotiate a peaceful settlement. In response, Yusuf imprisoned the Catholicos summoned Gagik to his court and crowned him king a second time. The military action foreseen by Sambat was not long in coming. In 909-910, Gagik allied his army with the Ostakhans and led the combined force in a campaign which first captured Nakhchivan and then seized Dovin, forcing the king to flee. When Sambat returned to Dovin with his army in the spring of 911. The Ostakhan again placed his troops under Gagik's command. By the end of the campaign, most of the Bagratid nobility, including Sumbat's youngest son, had been captured. The prisoners were turned, it, turned over to the Ostakhan, who had them poisoned. According to the history written by the Catholicos, Gagik, overcome with remorse at the death and destruction, fled into the mountains with his people. Gagik's withdrawal did nothing to aid Sumbat, whom Yusuf had trapped in a mountain fortress. The king turned for assistance, first to the caliph in Baghdad, and then to the emperor in Constantinople. But both courts were embroiled in crises, and no help was forthcoming. Sumbat submitted to Yusuf's terms, hoping to bring an end to the slaughter and destruction, and was allowed to return to Dovin. The respite was brief. In 913, Yusuf again stormed the city, and this time he took Sumbat prisoner. Sumbat remained at Dovin until 914, when Yusuf, unable to take a Bagratid fortress, had Sumbat brought to that city and tortured before the walls hoping to persuade those inside to surrender. And they remained steadfast. Yusuf ordered the king's death by decapitation. Sumbat's headless corpse was then returned to Dovin, where it was nailed to a cross and displayed on the city walls. And this is the historical context in which the royal messages conveyed by the decorative programs of Gagik Artsurni's palace and palace church must be viewed. And we begin tonight our examination with the palace. While the building itself no longer exists, according to the history of the house of the Artsurni, it was so lavishly decorated 
that a viewer attempting to examine just one section of the dome would be utterly overwhelmed and faint. Prominently featured amongst the visual splendors were multiple depictions of Gagik. He was shown seated on gilt thrones, flanked by princely attendants, lines of musicians, quote, women dancing in an admirable manner, end quote, men engaged in swordplay and wrestling matches, and by lions and other wild beasts and birds. There are no similar surviving representations of Armenian kings, nor do any descriptions of lost Armenian royal imagery parallel this description. There are also no parallels with contemporary Byzantine imperial art. The description of Kagik's palace portraits does evoke the iconography of the Islamic cycle of princely enter entertainments, which features an enthroned king flanked by attendants and animals traditionally associated with royalty, and frequently includes musicians, dancers, and contests of strength. And examples roughly contemporary with Akhtamar survive from the Abbasid courts at Samara and Baghdad, and from the court of the Spanish Umayyad Caliph. And I'm showing here um, just a detail from the west facade of Gagikar Zerni presenting a model of his church, which you may have heard last year, Christina, speaking of um, to the figure of Christ. And we move then to the east facade. Further evidence of the suggested emulation of Islamic iconography is found on the exterior of the Church of the Holy Cross. The east facade features a portrait of a ruler, and while various identities have been proposed for this figure, I suggest that it can only represent Hagi Arzruni. The presentation of this ruler not only corresponds to the textual descriptions of Babik's palace portraits, but as we shall see, it also corresponds to Babik's presentation elsewhere in the church. Babik then is shown haloed and crowned, sitting cross-legged on a cushioned platform throne, wearing a loose, undecorated tunic belted over trousers. He reaches with his left hand to pluck from a cluster of grapes and raises a glass with his right hand. He is flanked by two attendants in princely dress and by a lion and just off the screen, unfortunately, an eagle. A comparison of this portrait with a medallion issued by the reigning Abbasid Caliph, al Muqtadir reveals the extent of Islamic influence on Gahik's portrait. As you see on the front of this medallion, the caliph is shown seated cross-legged on a cushioned platform throne, raising a glass to chest level. The west facade of the church, probably the most famous aspect of the monument, features a second portrait of Gavi carved in monumental scale. This figure is uh, 3.5 approximately meters high. Gagik is haloed and wears a jeweled crown and a richly embroidered mantle over a tunic and trousers. He holds in his outstretched hand a model of his church which he proffers to the figure of Christ. It has been suggested that this portrait emulates depiction of Byzantine emperors, but I know of no surviving representation of living Middle Byzantine emperors which use such iconography. Indeed, Kavik's image differs from contemporary Byzantine portraits in almost every aspect. Kavik differs physically to Christ only with his feet. You see that he is frontal, but his feet are turned in the direction of Christ. And he's significantly larger than Christ. In Byzantine art, Emperors defer to Christ by turning, bending, or bowing, and while they, like Kagik, are frequently much better dressed than Christ, they are never larger. And I'm showing you here an ivory of Constantine VII, Porphyro Genetas, now in the Pushkin Museum, Constantine was a contemporary of Kagik's. Although there are no surviving contemporary Armenian works 
with which to compare Gaïd's portrait. The west portal of the cathedral at Wren, which dates to circa 640, features sculpture of Christ flanked by the saints Peter and Paul, and by two donors who are taller than the holy figures, suggesting that this use of scale was established in Armenia before the Arab invasions. Parallels are also found in Georgian art, where royal imagery typically includes the presentation of church models. A very badly damaged portrait group from Oshki, dating to 963-66, which I show you here um, in line drawing form, also features the same discrepancy of scale. Here are the two founders, seen on the far left and the far right, present a model of their church to the central, smaller figures of the diocese, Christ in the center, um, the Virgin here, John the Baptist here. Although the comparisons are limited, these examples suggest that Gait's portrait follows an established Caucasian tradition of royal imagery and is only distantly related to Byzantine representation. Juan Gauguin's image is, on one level, a straightforward presentation of his piety as donor. I suggest that it also conveys Gauguin's power through the use of Islamic courtly iconography. The vine frieze carved above the images of Gauguin and Christ is divided into two equal segments. To the left, above Gauguin, we see a doe accompanied, accompanied by her fawn, a bear nursing one cub while another rides on her back, a man plucking a pumpkin from a vine. These scenes are peaceful and even playful, emphasizing abundance, maternal protection, and nurturing, and the peaceful coexistence of humans and animals. And they contrast sharply with the scenes to the right, which are placed above the figure of Christ. Here we see a man in an unwelcome embrace by a bear, a man pulling two stout branches across his body, two curly horn rams engaged in a ferocious headbutting contest, and a kneeling man shooting arrows at a bear. The clear division between the gentle bucolic scenes on the left and the contrasting violent side of nature on the right is not found elsewhere on the church, confirming that the division of scenes on the west facade was deliberate. Juxtapositions of the peaceful and savage sides of nature are present in the courtly arts of both Byzantium and Islam. In Byzantium, such juxtapositions are found in imperial encomia, which use animal imagery to characterize and celebrate imperial power, and are also seen in palace art. Yet any similarity with Akhtamar is general rather than specific. None of the Byzantine examples includes representations of the current emperors, and more importantly, none visually stresses a clear division between peaceful and savage scenes, as is found at Akhtamar. Such clear divisions are a component of Islamic courtly art, where the iconography served to celebrate the beneficent reign of the caliph and his ability to protect his realm. The most famous example is an 8th century floor mosaic from a private audience hall at Kirba al -Maftar. The mosaic depicts a central fruit tree with two gazelles peacefully grazing to the left and a lion attacking a gazelle to the right. The scene is oriented to face the petitioner standing before the seated prince and serve to characterize the nature of Islamic rule. Just as the Hirbat al Maftar mosaic functioned in conjunction with the physical presence of a ruler, it may be suggested that the sculpted vine frieze on the west facade of the Church of the Holy Cross functions in visual combination with the portrait of Gharik beneath it. Gharik is represented symbolically 
as a ruler of a peaceful and prosperous land, and as a powerful defender of that land against enemies. This message is strengthened by the positioning of the peaceful bucolic scenes above the image of the king. One further presentation of Gagi, which appropriated Islamic iconography, may be suggested. And here again, I'm showing you, uh, before we move on, uh, the west facade with this equal division, the image of the king and Christ. The south facade of the church faced the royal palace, contained the main entrance to the church, and at an upper level, which is seen here, the doorway into the royal gallery. Yet despite these obvious royal associations, the facade does not display a portrait of the king. The sculpture surrounding the entrance into the royal gallery is now largely concealed by a bell tower that was built in the 16th century, you see it here, and is a freestanding structure, which was, prior to the recent restoration, slightly leaning away from the building, so a limber viewer could gain glimpses of the sculptural carvings uh, behind the belfry. I follow uh, Manatsu Kenyon's uh, reconstruction here. The gallery door is flanked by the confronted figures of a boar to the left and a lion to the right. Both are shown with lowered heads. Their snouts touch the edge of the door through which they passed. By means of their placement and orientation, these animals drew attention to the doorway and thus to the person of the king when he was present. And if we envision Gagi clothed in Islamic bestowed regalia in this doorway of his royal gallery, grant him a modest accompaniment of princely relatives or courtiers, and add to this mental picture the carved animals flanking the door, we are presented with a tableau which duplicates the iconographical elements of the east facade, where Gagik is flanked by princely attendants and animals indicative of royal status. These presentations of Gagik also parallel the description of his palace portraits and suggest that the decorative programs of the palace and palace church were linked by their presentations of Gagik as a powerful ruler. This suggested repeated appropriation of Islamic iconography implies our Zruni familiarity with Islamic expressions of power. The contemporary histories confirm this familiarity, documenting our Zruni imprisonment in the caliphal city of Samarra, visits to the Ostakhan's court in Azerbaijan, and intermarriage with high-ranking members of the Arab Emirates. The texts also describe a seemingly endless stream of gifts flowing from the caliph in Astakhan to Vespora Khan. These were undoubtedly crucial in the transmission of Islamic court iconography. This textual evidence, in combination with the description of Gavik's palace portraits and his surviving images on the exterior of his palace church, suggests that Islam provided the paradigm for the visual expression of Artsruni power. Gagik began construction on the Church of the Holy Cross in 915, less than one year after the death of his uncle and former king, Sambat. With the succession of Sambat's son, Ashok II, contested by the Ostakhan, Gagik was the dominant Armenian power. His piety, however, had been severely compromised by his collusion with Yusuf. In contrast, while Babrit's secular power was fragmented, the family's pious prestige was boosted to stratospheric heights by Sambat's death at the hands of the Ostakhan, by the miraculous events connected with his corpse, and by his subsequent swift canonization as a holy martyr. Gagi could not rest on the laurels of his own family's pious reputation. His father and grandfather had converted to the Muslim faith while imprisoned in the caliphal city of Samarra, 
and as we have seen, more recent damage to our Thruni piety had been inflicted by Gaik's elder brother, who was excommunicated by the Catholicos. While it was important that Gaik be perceived as a powerful ruler, I suggest that in order to maintain stable rule, it was equally important that he establish or re-establish his pious persona, and that this need determine the particular iconography of piety chosen for the Church of the Holy Cross. And we turn first in the interior to the orientation of the Christological cycle preserved in three registers in the interior of the church. The cycle begins in the uppermost register of the south apse above the royal gallery with a scene of the Annunciation. Here's the royal gallery as it was some five years ago. The scene of the Annunciation is here. The gallery itself, that is from this band down, is not decorated with narrative scenes, but was painted in imitation of hanging fabrics with richly jeweled borders. And the final scene in the cycle, here, the second coming of Christ, was directly beneath the gallery. The unusual orientation of this cycle can be attributed to the royal presence. The scenes are arranged so that Gagik was enclosed within a narrative cycle which began above his head and ended below his feet. This orientation and the painted backdrop of the gallery which focused attention on the king suggests that Gagik, when present, was himself incorporated into the decorative program. The drama of the dome features a second fresco cycle depicting events from the book of Genesis. And two peculiarities confirm that this cycle is also keyed to the royal gallery. First, the creation of Adam, the initial scene in the cycle, was not placed directly in front of the eastern apse where we would expect it, but instead was shifted to the northeast. The second peculiarity is the divergence from biblical chronology in the arrangement of the cycle's first four scenes. We have the creation of Adam, Adam in paradise, the creation of Eve, and then God giving Adam power over the animals. Now obviously if these scenes followed biblical chronology, the creation of Eve would have been the fourth scene here, and thus would have been directly above the Royal Gallery. And I suggest that the order of these scenes was altered to allow the positioning of two symbolically significant scenes directly above the King's Gallery. Of these two scenes, only the first remains, that depicting God giving Adam power over the animals. And I'll show you first um, what was left of the fresco. Um, here you see the creation of Eve, with Eve um, coming out of the torso of Adam. And then you see God here, better seen in this line drawing. The figure of God fills the space between a niche and a window. He gestures to the viewer's left towards the niche, which contains images of paired birds and fish, and above which are representations of small hooved animals. An identity for the following lost scene is suggested by the creation cupola in the atrium of San Marco in Venice, which preserves the iconography of the now destroyed 5th century cotton genesis. Here are the episodes of God granting Adam power over the animals and Adam naming the animals are conflated. And the narrative moves from the figure of God at the left to the right, where Adam names the animals. The placement of God and the direction of his movement in the San Marco cupola duplicates the presentation of the same elements in the Akhtamar drum cycle. Thus it may be suggested that in the Akhtamar drum cycle, the scene depicting God giving Adam power over the animals was originally followed by Adam naming the animals. And the former scene emphasizes the divine establishment of Adam's power, Adam's wise execution of this power, 
and the resultant peace and concord in his kingdom were emphasized in the suggested depiction of Adam naming the animals. Through their placement above the royal gallery and their proximity to the king, these two scenes would have suggested to the viewer below a parallel between the king of paradise and the king of Vaspur Khan. This parallel was emphasized by the sculpture of the gallery baluster. While it no longer survives, photographs record that it was decorated with animal head protomes representing a cross-section of the animal population. I particularly like the shaggy-faced elephant here. Intertwined with grapevines and pomegranates. <coughs> and now we will have a slight divergence for a technical interruption. There we go. This parallel of Adam and Gagik is, I suggest, continued in the scenes Excuse me, I'm sorry. Doing the technical stuff made me lose my place. According to this reconstruction, the members of Gagik's court assembled in the nave of his Palatine church would look up to see their king enthroned in his royal gallery, framed by the Christological cycle, behind a balustrade of carved animal heads, and beneath depictions of God giving Adam power over the animals and Adam naming the animals. This presentation of Gagi compares him with Adam as ruler of paradise, a comparison which characterizes the pious nature of Gagi's kingship, stressing his wisdom and authority and implying divine approval of his rule. The royal view that is, Gagik's view, was more critical, as it presented scenes stressing Adam's sin and redemption, and thus reminded Gagik of his sins. But it also offered the promise of his ultimate redemption. These royal messages were conveyed through a complex interweaving of frescoes, sculpture, and the physical presence of the king. The visual comparisons of Gagik and Adam are continued on the exterior of the church, linking the interior and exterior decorative programs. And then I go here. Return to the east facade. Actually, we shall return to the east facade. There we go. Where the iconography of power current in Islam is used to represent Gagik as a powerful ruler. And we see here Gagik's portrait that I discussed earlier. <laughs> Directly beneath the portrait is a second medallion, which contains a bust portrait of Adam. Can you see them? An inscription carved to the left of Adam's portrait emphasizes that he is shown as ruler in paradise, quote, and Adam gave names to all the animals and wild beasts, end quote. Further emphasizing this role are the heads of a lion and bull which flank Adam's portrait. And the precise vertical alignment of the two medallions confirms that the depiction of Adam was intended to be viewed in conjunction with that of the king above it, likening the rule of Gagik to that of Adam in paradise. In this Christian context, the wine, which previously symbolized courtly pleasures in the Islamic iconography of power, now becomes the wine of the sacrament. The sense of paradise is further reinforced on this facade by the figures of a lion, cheetah, and goat, which peacefully coexist on the main figural register. And the placement of the images of Adam, the king, and the peaceable animals on the east facade also reinforces the idea of paradise. According to tradition, the Garden of Eden was located in the east. The East was also believed to be the direction from which the faithful will witness the second coming, 
at which time Adam will be restored as ruler in paradise, and at which time the faithful, presumably including Gagi Gardzuni, will enter heaven. We return then to Gagik's monumental portrait. As we have seen on one level, this portrait combines with the vine trees above it to present Gagik as a powerful ruler and defender of his kingdom. Another level of interpretation is suggested by the contemporary texts. A description of this portrait in the history of the House of the Erzruni stresses its penitent nature. Quote, the glorious image of King Hagik stands before the Lord, depicted as if imploring the remission of his sins. Although there may be words of blame in our history, nevertheless, the king will not want in claiming the gifts he seeks, hoping for future restitution, end quote. And this, at first glance, seems to be a startling description, as the emphasis on pleading for forgiveness seems completely at odds with the actual depiction of the king. As carved on the west facade of his palace church, he seems anything but penitent. As we have seen, he defers to Christ only with his feet. He's significantly taller than Christ, and in his lavishly embroidered garments and bejeweled crown, he is much better dressed. The key to revolving the seeming discrepancy between the appearance of the royal image and its description is found in the history written by the Catholicos. We remember that according to this text, Gagik's Christian conscious experienced a reawakening following his collusion with the Austin Khan. The Catholicos states that Gagik, full of remorse, quote, did penance in accordance with the canons, end quote. The Armenian canon of penance required the penitent to face west and publicly renounce his sins. And the placement of Gagik's image on the west facade of the church is unique. No other portraits are so placed on Armenian churches constructed after the Arab invasions. This unique placement, when viewed in the context of contemporary events, suggests that on one level, the portrait represents Gagik's act of penitence. It is therefore the location of the portrait that allowed the historian truthfully to describe this sculpture as a petition for the remission of sins. And if Gagik's sins are here referred to obliquely, his hoped for redemption, which is also emphasized in the textual description of the portrait, is given clear expression. Two seraphim flank the figures of Gagik and Christ, here and here. And I suggest they are the key to correctly interpreting the pious message of this portrait group. The Armenian apocryphal tradition features a promise made to Adam at the expulsion that he will be restored as ruler in paradise. And while the seraph of the Genesis cycle in the drum of the dome is visually exclusive, barring Adam from paradise, the seraphim on the west facade are inclusive, protectively enclosing both Christ and the king. And these seraphim, I suggest, thus serve to locate the scene in paradise. The west facade thus presents the final suggested visual association of Gagik and Adam on the palace church, with the king compared to Adam, who has been restored as ruler in paradise after the second coming. This comparison is emphasized by the sculpted heads of a lion and bull, the lion here and the bull here, placed above the portraits. Heads of these same animals flank the portraits of Adam on the east facade. The analysis of the royal messages conveyed by Geek's palace and palace church demonstrates that the visual expressions of power and the ideologies <coughs> which formed them were remarkably fluid, traversing geographical religious, and cultural boundaries. Yet while the iconography of power was ethnically neutral, 
Evidence suggests that the iconography of piety was ethnocentric. The visual expressions of Gagik's piety were meant for members of one group, the Armenian Orthodox faithful. To such viewers, the incorporation into the royal portraits of references to specific Armenian rites and apocryphal traditions would serve to underscore the specifically Armenian nature of Gagik's piety. Thank you. Period and uh, you know, being Christian, <coughs> they could have uh, been under the influence of uh, Byzantine uh, rule. Uh, I, I see your point. Yes, indeed, um, there is that similarity. However, um, the apocryphal uh, animal images first come into being in the uh, late seventh century, and if there were two the lion and the bull, then why would we not have the other two You had the ego, as and well. then there is the human being, the core of them, all four of them. Right, yeah. and I also uh, direct your attention to the gables in the church where we have the four evangelists. Mm -hmm. And so one would think that if we had these four evangelists, <coughs> then we would have some direct connection with those animals, and we do not. It's not consistent. Uh, my other question was, um, in Islam, uh, they don't use uh, human beings in their artwork. Uh, Not in religious buildings, but they certainly do in other buildings, certainly. Yeah. And this is a, a religious building, and, and they still but it's set not, up that influence. But it's not a Muslim building. Right. No. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I, I think you can see, I mean, think about the location of Abu Mar. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's coming there as a guest of the king would be escorted out and to the caliph or the emirs or to the local important um, Muslim officials, they would certainly see one message. But it is the faithful that would see a completely different message. And I think that is really the key as to what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, in this picture, the relief of uh, Gagik and, and Christ and all the others, except for Gagik's head, they, they, they look fine. But Gagik's head looks like quite work, worn out or weathered or damaged. Or, is there any reason for that? Or? Um, the parts that stood out the most are the parts that are damaged the most. And his beard was apparently quite full and curly. And his crown was uh, very full as well and had great depth, as we would expect. Um, his tunic and robe are decorated with extraordinary carvings that are not found on any of the other 252 figural images on the church. Um, so the degree to, to which the attention is given his image is reflected in the depth with which he is carved. And as we know from even classical Greek sculptures, things that stick out get broken off. There is, of course, some vandalism that has happened, but um, I don't see this as being part of that. That's due to a higher relief. Yes. Yes, Mark. <laughs> Perhaps you would like to comment on the restoration. Oh. Um, Since you mentioned it. Well, um, as many of you may know, uh, UNESCO recently um, funded uh, a res restoration of uh, Octomar, and uh, they worked with um, the Designing Planet of uh, Designing uh, Program uh, Department at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, the idea was to develop this island as a major tourist attraction, and they redesigned not only uh, the boat dock at Jebash, but um, 
the amenities for tourists on the island. There is now a cafe, et cetera, et cetera, as well as, or in addition to, uh, sort of shoring up uh, the Church of the Holy Cross. We've got cafes on the island now? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, the Octomar Cafe. Um, and uh, I should say that I have not been to the island since its restoration. I have heard reports, I have seen images. Um, it seems to me analogous with those of you who know the reconstruction of the Byzantine walls outside of Istanbul, um, how they have become sort of disnified. That's not quite a word, but they turned into a, a sort of Disneyland version of what, what were the Theodosian walls. This is exactly what is unfortunately happened at Akhmar. The good thing is they put a roof on the building. Um, that's good. Uh, the, the bad thing is they, they pump the building full of cement, um, which of course with the volcanic building and the um, changes in temperature is, is not a good thing for the frescoes. Um, they also uh, restored the frescoes in um, alarmingly broad strokes. I think that's the best way I can describe it. Um, oh, well, who is they? Uh, the UNESCO team, the Italian oh. architects, and the Turkish partners. It was, I believe, they had four different groups involved. Uh, I went on a regular basis to UPenn and complained, and nothing much happened. This is, you know, obviously done for reasons other than preserving the building. Um, and it's, it's, it's a great shame if it's in fact as bad as it seems to be. On the other hand, we have extraordinary documentation of the building before the restoration, and it seems that the restoration was done so that it can be removed at a future point. And um, that is what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Going and scrape those things off the wall. Can you explain why the cement is bad for the first one? Uh, cement contracts and expands. The different coefficients of expansion. Right, unlike the volcanic stone with which the church is made. So when the cement uh, expands, the first bits pop off the wall, which is not a good thing. Did they remove <laughs> a few more uh, uh, cracks when they cemented the uh, floor? Uh, the gematoon? No, they did not. It's just still there. They've, they've absolutely ignored any excavation. There was no digging whatsoever, no archaeological exploration at all. So you can didn't have much input? Um, no. I had a lot of input. It was not received. <laughs> um, it, it was uh, sort of down on the, on the down low, as it were. Yes. Was the restoration done for revenue purposes? No, it was done, I believe, and, and this is just my personal belief and would not be um, probably what anybody involved in the restoration would tell you, but it was done as part of Turkey's bid to get into the EU. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. so there was a controversy about the presence or absence of a cross at the, uh, the dome. Yes. Uh, what's your point um, on that? The cross had apparently been uh, placed up there at some point um, in the 18th or, or perhaps early 19th century. Um, and it came down during the restoration. And I have heard nothing about its fate, nor whether it shall be put back up. Um, I don't know whether that is malice aforethought or incompetence. Or yes, yes, or yes, yes. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, about this uh, west side, um, between Christ and Gagik and below them, on the two sides are the seraphim, but below them, underneath the uh, window opening, what are those two? Um, they are the, the, that's actually no longer there, um, unfortunately. That was cut out. Uh, it was vandalized, looted. Um, what? Uh, about five years ago, um, oh. and it's been reconstructed uh, on the basis of these photographs in concrete. Um, but they are two smaller angels holding up the Holy Cross. Is that what it is? Yes, that yes. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. He just keeps giving you the message. Uh, everything about this church is is uh, really on message uh, and keeps ramming home the idea that he is a powerful man and a pious man. Mm -hmm. Why did he use the blasphemy here? Because usually in all the other churches you see it's relief. This one is blasphemy. Uh, it's an exception. Practically. Well, the key there is all the other churches you see. Yeah. Um, as an art historian, I am of the opinion that there are very few unique things surviving today. It is just the accident of survival. Mm -hmm. um, this could not have been constructed in the very short time in which it was built, five and a half years, if it had been new, mm -hmm. um, if it had been a new technique and a new idea. Um, it, it, to me, as a scholar indicates, that this was a prevailing building technique in the area. I, I have read that uh, the church at Aftermath is essentially a larger version of a church, I think, uh, saying, uh, Bartholomew, which, if I remember correctly, I was told or read was near the Turkish Iranian border. I think on the Turkish side. Do you have any information? Um, the church is a pl the plan of the church has been specifically related to many other, but the truth is, it's a very standard plan. And it's very easy to take it and say, oh, it, it was meant to be this. So we have absolutely no evidence, textual or physical, that it is intended to copy anything. Well, not the plan of the church, but in terms of the scope of and so forth. There's nothing quite like this that survives. We have bits and pieces here and there, ranging from Ani all the way down, yes, into uh, modern-day Palestine. Um, even in Jerusalem, we see some of this. Um, but nothing with this sort of uh, complexity. Could you, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Could you say this is typically Armenian boots all the way along, or is it was it influenced by? It was built much later. Which is the earliest, let's say, Byzantine church architecture? What's the earliest Byzantine church, and was it influenced by it? Was what influenced well, by it? Well, in other words, would this be called, you said a typical plan. Right. It was used by Byzantines, or? No, no, a typical Armenian church plan is what I indicated. Um, um, the Byzantine plan evolved from one thing to another. As, as you probably know, it went from Basilica to Cross and Square over the years. Um, and as to when Byzantium starts, um, if you talk to historians, it's the seventh century. Uh, with Heraclius, who begins fighting the Persians and ends his reign fighting the Arabs and the Muslims. Uh, if you talk to art historians, we want to count Hagia Sophia as Byzantine, so we push it back to Justinian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, even the dates of Byzantium are still sort of up for grabs. Yes. Do you know what the procedure is of getting UNESCO involved in such a restoration? Uh, it needs to be undertaken on the highest levels of the government. Um, there needs to be a coalition of the board members of, I believe it's five of the, the countries on the board need to agree. Um, they send out a research team to evaluate. And um, I, I knew nothing of this until it was half done. Is there a definition of restoration? Because this does not sound like restoration to no. me at all. No. I think it's an insult to the word, never mind to the church. Yes. Yes, so yes, I, and it's, it's I, I not at all... I using another word so we can throw uh, that down. Well, yes. I don't mean you. Yes, I can't use another word um, because I, I still work in the area. Um, but um, it's not restricted, of course, to this one monument. It happens everywhere. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, it, it's not the, this, this kind of restoration. It's not restricted to Turkey or to Armenian monuments, but it, it is universal. It is unfortunate. Um, it is um, sort of slapdash work. Um, it is also usually motivated by politics rather than artistic concerns. <coughs> I went through, stayed in France for a while, 
and we went to a place that were restored. And I remember Monsieur Triou saying, c'était restauré, c'est abominable. It is true, it is true, it is true. Yes. Um, so some of us were there two, two Junes ago, mm -hmm. and taking the boat over to the island, it's just like a, a chilling thing to see the top of the church appear and then the form appear. Do you have any idea, do we have any drawings or anything of the, of the palace and like what, what it might have looked like compared to the church? Well, we have absolutely nothing. Um, the difficulty is that it was, of course, a functioning monastery um, until uh, 1950. Um, so as a almost continually occupied site, um, there is very little evidence. And now um, there has been, no one has been able to get an archaeological permit uh, from the Turkish government for the island. Um, I've been trying for 15 years. Um, so, um, there is some hope that we can do some scanning um, and try to find some foundation walls, but the difficulty is we don't know which foundation walls those are. Um, so what we really have to go by is the uh, contemporary description of the palace. And the palace was before in front of? Yes, um, we're looking at the west facade, and it was in front of the south facade where the belfry is now. Which is as you would approach it from land. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Which means that the power structure is much more important than the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Um, she asked. Uh, she said that the floor slabs had been pulled up two years ago. Um, did anyone here see that? As as when I saw it, we heard. Well, my cousin Nancy Collision is the one that told me that she heard from someone that previous to the restoration, over what period I don't know. That slabs in the floor had been pulled up and thrown into the yeah. lake. I remember. Not that it happened. I remember the story. The people who took us there did a, um, a, a a run, a dry run, before they took us, and that was a few months before we got there, actually. And that's when they saw, and I believe they took photographs of the slabs on the floor before the concrete was poured. That's that's what it was. Well, I remember the slabs being broken, um, but I find it very difficult to believe that uh, such high quality material would not be reused, that it would be put into the water as opposed to being carted back and reused somewhere. My suspicions would be that if you go back into some of the Kurdish villages in, in the mountains, you would find it, which is where we found two of the heads from the balustrade, which are now in the Van Museum, in storage, in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> What's the difference between a relief and a bas relief for those of us who know? Um, um, a, a bas relief is um, something that has a greater depth, and a relief can be almost anything. So it's just it's a it's a degree of um, how far out it comes, basically. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye.